it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. This video we want to ask the question, what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? When did he become Lord? How long is he going to be Lord? We want to focus in on that question. Uh, we're doing this because we already looked in the last video, we asked the question, what is the gospel? And particularly, what is the summary, the, the very core of the gospel? And the core of the gospel is not that Jesus died for our sins so that if we believe him, we could go to heaven. Before the gospel is about us and our salvation, it's about Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And so we noted that the summary, the very core of the gospel throughout the book of Acts and that also throughout the epistles, which later hopefully we'll be able to get into, is the fact that Jesus is Lord. That's the primary aspect of the gospel. We could expand that and say Jesus is the risen Lord, that he was risen from the dead. We can go further and say Jesus is the risen Lord that died for our sins according to the scripture. We could go further and say that he's the risen Lord that died for our sins according to the scripture and is coming back to judge the living and the dead. And he is the one that was the eternal God to come in the flesh. So we can expand it out uh, as they do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the four gospels. They, they paint the whole picture of what the gospel is. But if we really nail it down, it is that Jesus Christ is Lord. We see this in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So it's important that we know the very core of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ is also the gospel of salvation and grace. If we repent and trust in him, we will receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life as long as we abide in him. And so in this video, we want to jump to Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This is the summary of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, his first gospel proclamation, public proclamation of the gospel after Jesus rose from the dead. And here is the summary. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so we want to focus in on the fact that here it says that God made Jesus Christ into Lord. Um, this can be confusing for some people and uh, some, uh, you know, uh, false teaching, false teachers will use this to, uh, to defame or to blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll say, see, if God made him into Lord, that means he wasn't always Lord. And since he's not always Lord, that means he's not God. And so those in the Unitarian camp will say, Jesus is not God. He's not from eternity, but he was only made Lord. He was a man that was made into Lord. And so we want to ask the question, what does it mean that God, that Jesus was made Lord, that God made this Jesus whom you crucified Lord? Because a lot of times we will think of the term Lord as the, the name of God. In the Old Testament, depending on your version, when you read the Old Testament, it will have Lord in all caps, L-O-R-D. And when it says that, it's the name of God, which would be translated from the Hebrew would be Yahweh. But at other times, it just has a capital L or a lowercase L, and it just says Lord. And sometimes that's, uh, you know, that can be different, uh, different Hebrew words. Adonai is one of the words, and we're gonna look at that in just a minute. But so Lord is distinct from the title God. So God and Lord are two different things. Let's go ahead and make that clear by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Now this verse, we go into it uh, more in the series on the Trinity. I'll try to point, put that up here. Uh, the series of the Trinity, you can take a look at that. But here's what it says. But for us, there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, 
through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So we see clearly that speaking of the Father as God and of Jesus Christ as Lord. And in the last, uh, in, in the video on the, the Trinity, we looked in depth into many different passages that make this distinction. Jesus Christ the Lord and God the Father. So there is a clear distinction between the term Lord and uh, God. Now in the New Testament, it becomes confusing. Sometimes the term Lord is used to refer to God the Father. Uh, and so it becomes confusing. But let's go ahead and jump over here to Acts chapter 2, verse 29. And we want to ask the question, what does it mean that Jesus Christ has been made Lord by the Father? Verse 29, brothers, I speak confidently to you concerning the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So this is because he just referred to a psalm by David, uh, and it was a prophecy. But verse 30, But being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of his seed, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit upon his throne. So God gave a promise to David that one of his descendants would sit on the throne, the throne of David. Verse 31, he foresaw this and spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So there's a prophecy given about uh, that David spoke in uh, Psalm chapter, let's see here, to, to, to Psalm chapter 16, maybe? I think it's in, yes, Psalm chapter 16. So where, uh, where David talks about that you will not abandon your, your Holy One uh, to the grave, nor let him see corruption. And so he's saying this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ when he was raised from the dead. Verse 31, For he saw this and spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, and his soul was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Verse 32, God raised up this Jesus, of whom we are all witnesses. So God raised up Jesus Christ, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you now see and hear. So what is the fulfillment? of the promise to David that one of his descendants would sit on his throne. Is it Jesus sitting on a throne in Jerusalem? No, it is Jesus now seated at the right hand of God, Lord of heaven and earth, that he has now poured out the spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. And so that is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet. It's greater than the prophecy that they, what they were waiting for to be fulfilled in the prophecy. If we jump to verse 34, for David has not ascended to the heavens, yet he says, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So here's the thing. The Lord said to my Lord. Now, if we read this in Greek, both of these words, the Lord said to my Lord, both Lord there is referring to kurios or kurios. It is, it is, in other words, it just means Lord. But if we flip back to Psalm 110, where this is quoted from, we will see a distinction if we look at it in the Hebrew. And this is what those in the Unitarian camp will make much of. And we want to make much of it because it's, it's uh, a biblical truth, but we don't want to abuse it and we don't want to ignore other biblical truths. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, notice, it, depending on your version, that it's all caps. So it's talking about Yahweh. So Yahweh said to my Lord. So it's lowercase, so that's talking about Adonai. So Yahweh said to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Lord here... Uh, Yahweh says to my Lord or to my king or to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If we go on, verse 2, the Lord shall send your mighty scepter out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will follow you in the day of your battle on the holy mountains at dawn at the, of the morning. The dew of your youth belongs to you. So we see that it began in Jerusalem. This is why Jesus sent his disciples to go preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. So the, the, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, it began in Jerusalem, but it has taken over. It is going throughout the entire world. So if we flip back here to Acts chapter 2, we get an understanding that when it says, the Lord said to my Lord, when it's talking about Jesus Christ being made Lord, it's talking about him being made the king, seated at the right hand of God, being the king over all the nations. Uh, we could look at Psalm chapter 2. You can flip back there if you want. Let's go ahead and turn there. Psalm chapter 2 is another passage about the Messiah. And we'll see this language about the prophecy about what is happening, what in what sense Jesus is made Lord. Okay? Verse two, chapter 2, verse 1, Psalm 2, 1. 
Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. So the rebellious world rebels against the Lord, Yahweh, and his anointed, his Christ. They say, let us tear off their bonds and cast away their ropes from us. So we don't want to be under the bondage of Yahweh and his Christ. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord ridicules them. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his burning anger. And he says, the Lord says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. So the anointed or the, the Messiah, the uh, Christ is the same term that's used for my king. I've installed my king or the Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Verse 7, I will declare the decree of the Lord. So this is, this is going to be Christ speaking. He said to me, you are my son. This day I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You will break them with a scepter of iron. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now be, then you kings, be wise, be admonished. You judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and tremble with trepidation. Kiss the son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is kindled in a flash. Blessed are all who seek refuge in him. So we see here very clearly that Jesus Christ is made king. He is made Lord. At, at his resurrection, he is exalted and made Lord. That's what we're reading about here in Acts chapter 2. That he, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We can see it summed up if we flip over to Matthew chapter 28, a familiar passage, the Great Commission. What we see here, Matthew chapter 28, we see the scepter coming out of Zion, as it said in Psalm 110. Then Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So this is greater than just being a king in Jerusalem. He has been made Lord over all of God's creation. Verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So because he has all authority over all the nations now, he sends us out to go make disciples, teaching them to submit to him as Lord. The gospel is that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's seated on the throne, has all authority, and we can come to him to receive mercy. So going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we can, or verse 36, we can read it again here and it can make sense to us. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he has been made into the king of all kings, the one with all authority, he has been made into the Messiah. And so we need to ask the question, the next question is, when was he made Lord? Because it says, God made this Jesus Lord. When was Jesus made Lord? Now we already looked at Psalm uh, 110, uh, that it's talking about him becoming Lord. We looked at Matthew chapter 28. When did that happen? When was he given all authority in heaven and earth? It says it was after his resurrection, he was given all authority in heaven and earth. And we can understand this. If we go to Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23 uses a phrase here that can really help us to comprehend this idea of when did Jesus become Lord? Luke chapter 23, this is gonna be whenever uh, the thief on the cross was crucified next to Christ. Verse 42, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So what does it mean to come into your kingdom? Uh, it, it just means that he was going to be seated on the throne, that he was going to be ruling as king. He was going to be seated there with the authority and ruling over all of his enemies, as it said in Psalm 110. So he came into his kingdom. But before this, was he king? So our clear answer, when did Jesus? When was Jesus made Lord? Well, okay, at his resurrection exaltation at the right hand of God, he was made Lord. But was he Lord before this? If we flip over to John chapter 13, we see that indeed, even before the resurrection of Christ, he was Lord. John chapter 13, verse 13, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says this, you call me teacher and Lord, you speak accurately, for so I am. So he claims here that before he died on the cross, he was already Lord. We can see this also in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus went and he sat on the mountain. And then he said, you've heard it said in the old covenant, but I say to you. 
And then when he came down from the mountain, the, everybody was surprised because he spoke with authority, as one with authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisee, because he did indeed have authority. He was the Lord and he was giving his law on that mountain. He was the king. And so we see that uh, also, and if we turn over to Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So it's very clear that even when Jesus was ministering on earth before his crucifixion and resurrection, he was Lord. But before that, even, if we look to Luke chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11, this is when the angel spoke to the shepherds before the birth of Christ and said, verse 10, but the angel said to them, listen, do not fear, for I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, this is interesting here because we see three uh, words here, Savior. And the question is, well, who is Jesus? He's the Savior. He was born a Savior, but who has he saved? At that point, he hadn't saved anyone. He hadn't died on the cross for anyone's sin. He hadn't risen and welcomed and reconciled anybody to God. He was a Savior even before he had done the work of a Savior. Who is Christ? Christ, what does it mean? He's the anointed. Well, when was Jesus anointed? He was anointed not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. When he was baptized by John, then the Spirit of God came on and he was anointed. That's why in Luke chapter 4, he then goes into the synagogue after his temptation and he proclaims, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So he was already Christ. He was born as Christ. But here it says, who is Christ the Lord? So even though he was not, he had not yet come into his kingdom, was not sitting and ruling over his enemies, he was a baby in a manger. Nevertheless, he was already Lord. He was born to be the Lord. We see this if we uh, turn over to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, when he was speaking, when Jesus was speaking to Pontius Pilate, we see this. Uh, verse 35. Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. Oh, let's, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good. You handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from here. So he's proclaiming that he is king. Verse 37, therefore Pilate said to him, then you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. So he's proclaiming the truth that he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What's the truth that he's bearing witness to? That he is Christ, that he is the Lord. And why did he come into this world? He came into the world for this very purpose, that he would be king. So that's why we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, that he was born as Savior, as Messiah, and as King. So when was Jesus made Lord? We can say very clearly that when he was exalted and seated at the right hand of God, that he was made Lord, that he received the Spirit of God and poured it out on the day of Pentecost, which was evidence that he was seated on the throne as Lord. But even before that, when he was hung up on the cross, what did it say? It said, this is the king of the Jews. Here, Jesus in John chapter 18 is declaring that he is a king. He is the Lord before he even goes to the cross. But on the cross, this is the king of the Jews. He had a crown of thorns. He was high and lifted up. He was enthroned on that cross because he was already Lord. In his teaching, he said, you call me teacher and Lord. That's true because I am your Lord. I am your master. And uh, we, he says it over and over again. He says, you know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do, do not do what I say? So he often proclaimed his lordship. He sat on the mountain and gave his law as Lord. But even before that, he was born as the king. So how do we make sense of this? When did Jesus become Lord? Uh, a couple examples that we can look at in the Old Testament. If we ask, when did uh, Solomon come into his kingdom. Well, he came into his kingdom right whenever David was about to die. Then David already anoint, or set him on the throne. And so he was there even while David was still alive. So that's when he came into his kingdom. But before that, when he was born, God had given a promise to Bathsheba, or not God, but uh, uh, David had given a promise to Bathsheba that her son would be his heir, that her son, uh, Solomon, would be the next king. And so this is why we can say that Solomon was born as king. 
Even though he hadn't yet come into his kingdom, nevertheless, he was born to be king. For the very, the very promise was already made to Bathsheba that he was the king. So we could say King Solomon, even before he was made king at his uh, coronation when he, became, uh, when he came into his kingdom. We can also look at David. David, uh, when did he become king? Well, it was after a, a lot of running around and being chased by Saul. But even before that, whenever Saul, uh, Samuel came to him and anointed him, he anointed him to be king over Israel. So he was already king, even though he wasn't publicly acknowledged as king. So during his uh, battles and all the things that he was doing, he was already the king of the Jews. He was already king over Israel. But it wasn't until he came into his kingdom that everybody acknowledged him as king. So in the same way, we can look at Jesus Christ and say, look, he was born to be king, just like Solomon, that he was uh, on earth, even though he wasn't acknowledged as king by all, he was already king. He was already Lord. So God's son, Jesus Christ, came in the world to be king. He was born as king. He was anointed as king at his baptism. He died as a king on the cross, and he was risen and seated in his kingdom. And he's coming back to judge all of his enemies on the last day, and he will be acknowledged by all, and all will confess. Every tongue in heaven and on earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he will come into the fullness of his kingdom. But this brings up another issue that is often raised by those in the Unitarian camp. So, Jesus is Lord. They will acknowledge that. They will acknowledge that he's the king seated on the throne, uh, that he's coming back, that every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord, uh, that he's going to raise the dead. Uh, those that deny his divinity uh, and in the Unitarian camp will, will acknowledge all of that. But then they will go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and they'll look at verses like verse 28. It says, When all things are subject to him, that's Christ, then the Son himself, Christ, will also be subject to him, that's the Father, who put all things under him, that God may be all in, in all. And they'll say, see, look, there's coming a time when this, it's like, I'm not sure how they all uh, describe it, but there's in some sense, they will point to this passage and say, see, he's going to be submitted to the Father in such a way that he's going to be no longer Lord in the same way that God the Father is Lord. So if we jump up to verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by man, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all dies, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he will deliver up the kingdom of God the Father to the to God the Father. Up, he will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he will reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And so those in the Unitarian camp and maybe some other uh, theological errors will raise this and say, see, Jesus' kingdom is not going to last forever. But there's going to come a time when he stops being Lord and God the Father will rule. So, so questions that we must ask about this passage, that interpretation of this passage. First of all, we have to ask, okay, so if Jesus is ruling now, uh, and is the father ruling? Because it says that he's going to hand up the kingdom to the father. So is the father not ruling at this present moment? No, of course he is ruling at this present moment. Also, it says that in verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. So does that mean that Jesus Christ is not now submitted to the father? Of course he's submitted to the Father. He's ruling on the throne of God with God and for God as God's Son. And so he is ruling there. So the idea that there's going to come a time when the kingdom of Jesus Christ ends, he gives it off to the Father, then the Father will become Lord, and he is no longer Lord. And it's a time when he finally submits to the Father as if he hasn't been submitted to the Father the entire time. And so this is the interpretation of this passage that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up with the scriptures, because what we know is that on the day when Jesus Christ comes and puts all his enemies under his feet and every tongue confesses that he is Lord, that will be the time when his kingdom is finally commencing, when he is actually ruling over all of his enemies, not just that he's ruling in the midst of his enemies, as it says in Psalm chapter 110, but when he brings all his enemies in subjection under his feet. So what does it say here in verse what does it mean in verse 24? Then comes the end when he will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he will reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. 
For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is revealed that he, that is God, who has put all things under him, is exception. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So what is it saying here? It's saying that God has put Jesus on his throne and he has given him a task to bring everything into submission to the will of the Father. This is why we pray, uh, Father, uh, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does that kingdom come? It comes through the name and the power and the glory of Jesus Christ. He is presently ruling in the midst of his enemies and he is gonna bring all of his enemies underneath his feet. What is the last enemy that is to be put under his feet? Death. And so at the resurrection, because Jesus said in John chapter five, verse uh, 29, he says that all, that all will hear the voice of the son of, of man and those that hear will be raised to life. Those that have done good to everlasting life and those that have done evil to everlasting condemnation. And so we see that at the last day, the last thing that God is, Jesus Christ is gonna do is bring death under submission. He's gonna transform this entire world into the kingdom of the Father. He's gonna submit all things and he's gonna hand it as an offering to the Father and say, Father, I have done your work. I have submitted all things unto you to the will of God the Father and now the kingdom of God has come. Does this mean that he is going to stop reigning? Indeed, it does not mean he's going to stop reigning. It means now the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ have now become. We read this if we go to Revelation chapter 11. If we go to verse 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the Lord have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So, God is going to reign forever and ever, and that kingdom is the kingdom of our Lord, uh, the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And so we see that God the Father is going to reign forever through His Son Jesus Christ. If we flip to Isaiah chapter nine, some will say, "Oh no, no, no! You're just abusing the passage. It means that He's until means that He's going to reign, and then His reign is going to be over. No way! His reign is not going to be over because we read in Isaiah." chapter 9 uh, starting let's see starting in verse 6 for unto us a child is born unto us, us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice and with righteousness from now until forever the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this the kingdom of the lord jesus christ is an eternal kingdom we see this if we flip over to daniel chapter 7 Daniel chapter 7 is a prophecy about the Son of Man, Messiah, at the resurrection. We see very clearly it's the Ancient of Days seated on the throne. And then in verse 13, it says, I saw in the night visions, and there was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So Jesus Christ, at his resurrection, was exalted and seated, came before the Father. Verse 14, there was given to him a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. If we flip over to the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Therefore, brothers, diligently make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly provided for you. It's very clear that Jesus Christ's kingdom will have no end. His dominion will last forever. He will be ruling with his Father over all things for all eternity. At present, he is ruling in the midst of his enemies, and he is going to rule and bring them into submission. The last thing that he will bring into submission is death itself, when he will provide the resurrection, make a new heavens and new earth. And when he does that, he will offer to the Father and say, this is the kingdom that now I have now brought to you. I have now submitted all things to your will and the Father and the Son will reign for eternity. So what does it mean that Jesus Christ is Lord? It means that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. When did he become Lord? 
Well, at his exaltation, he was made Lord. He was given that authority. But even before that, at his cross, in his ministry, even at his birth, because he was born for that very purpose, he came into the world to testify of the truth. And the truth is that he is king, that he is Lord. And how long will his kingdom last? It is an everlasting kingdom. He is right now bringing all things into submission to the will of the Father. And at the end, that God will reign through all and in all by the power of his Son, Jesus Christ, the very image of God. Now, the next question that we need to ask, and we'll get into it in the next video, is who has the right to sit on the throne and to be Lord of heaven and earth? Those in the Unitarian camp will say that Jesus is just a man. He was born as a normal man. He obeyed the Father, and because he obeyed the Father, he was exalted to the right hand of God and made Lord of heaven and earth. This is an outrageous claim because no man is worthy to be seated at that, at that place, to rule over all of eternity, to rule over all of God's creation. There's only one that could rule over all of God's creation. That is God himself. And so in the next a video, God willing, we will look into and ask the question, not what is Lord and not when did Jesus become Lord or how long he's going to be Lord, but we're going to ask the question, who is this one that became Lord? Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.